here because you know for social security and stuff you want to do the best thing all set thank you so much for your help oh now i'm off off the screen here guys oh there we go i'm back okay Mark walked into the church one Sunday, and I was there in the foyer to greet him, as I often did on Sunday mornings, and uh, I was excited to see Mark because it was the first Sunday uh, back in church after he had a heart attack. And Mark was uh, kind of a, a little bit of a larger fellow, and so it was obvious as part of the, the contributing factors to his heart attack. And I said, Mark, how are you doing? He goes, well, uh, better, obviously, I'm alive, but the doctor said if I don't change my diet completely, I'm going to die. Wow, that, that's pretty serious, huh? He goes, yeah, I mean, if I was just, I mean, you know, I, I love fast food and I love sweets. And he said, you got to cut all that out or you are going to die. I said, well, that's going to be a big life change for you. He said, Steve, I can't do it. I just love food too much. And I don't know what happened to Mark because he moved within a year to another state. Um, I actually was talking to somebody in the last class that knew, knew him, and they said he had another heart attack. Mm. But he's still alive. So I thank the Lord for that. But I was shocked by his statement. He said, I just can't stop. And what he was saying was he was addicted to food. He had a life-dominating sin that was taking its toll and had devastating consequences in his life. And so we're here today to talk about life-dominating sins and a strategy to help. And so I hope that this is helpful. Now, I don't know why you're here. If you yourself are dealing with a life-dominating sin, then I pray that I can give you some helpful tips and would be more than happy to pray with you and for you uh, if you want to come and, and share that with me after the fact. I'm guessing more likely you're here because you have a shepherd's or a pastoral heart and you want to help others. And I thank the Lord for this many people with that sort of a, a heart. And so I'm going to be sharing this more from that perspective. Now again, if the shoe fits, wear it for sure. But I'm hoping that we can help equip you to be better friend to your friend. Because in, in all honesty, many people struggle with sin, and they struggle in silence. Because sin is embarrassing. Sin is not what Christians are supposed to be doing. And honestly, the church has not been very good about helping people. We're very good at condemning people for their sin, but we're not as good at helping them. And so I hope that's why you're here, because you want to be a friend, you want to be a godly counselor, you want to be a shepherd like the Lord Jesus. So we want to talk about dominating, life-dominating sins, but another word for it, um, probably more common in our society today, would be called addiction. And so um, that's why I, I reference this book, The Heart of Addiction, because it deals with uh, these matters that are very difficult. Now, I'll probably bounce back and forth between addiction and life-dominating sin, but I want to... Um, caution us that we don't allow the world to define biblical terms for us because I don't think addiction as a word shows up in the Bible and so if I if I come to you with an addiction where do you look in the Bible but if I come to you with a sin then usually that sin will be called out somewhere in the scriptures and so if we want to have biblical answers we probably want to define things biblically and so, again, I'll use the word addiction because it's so common and, and known. But when you're working with people, try to get them away from using that terminology because I think it's, it's uh, unhelpful in the long run. But I want to give you some definitions. And it's a persistent habitual. Um, and I put habitual instead of compulsive because when a, the way it's defined by Webster's is compulsive. But compulsive has the idea of it just happens. I can't, I can't control the switch. And so when we use... Uh, compulsion in my actions, my attitudes, my thoughts, I'm giving myself an excuse, which I don't think 
certainly as a believer, I don't have. So it's a habitual use of a substance, a behavior, or an activity that has harmful effects. Okay, so again, people are hurting themselves, and we want to be um, spiritual first responders and helping with those problems that people are having. Um, these addictions or, or life-dominating sins often produce physical dependency. Uh, certainly when it comes to uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, that's a very true thing. Actually, I've read a couple of books about pornography, and it says that you, the wiring in your brain actually gets rewired when you are addicted to pornography. And so there's a physiological change that occurs with some of these uh, addictive sins. And so uh, there is a physical dependency. Uh, the addiction occurs when you repeatedly satisfy a natural appetite, and we'll talk about appetites in a sec, and a desire with a temporary pleasure until you end up becoming a servant of that temporary object rather than the master. Uh, we have a, a passage in Romans that addresses this. Romans chapter 6, it says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So the, there's good news and bad news in these verses. The bad news is you are a slave. Every person in this room is a slave. The good news is you get to choose who your master is. It's either going to be unrighteousness, and sin or righteousness resulting in sanctification. And so if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you get to choose. Who do you want to be your master? You know, if, if you're not a Christian, and certainly we all know people that are Christians, they are slaves to sin. And so it's really unfair of us to think that they should be acting like Christians. They can't. I used to play a lot of street hockey with my brothers and our friends, and most of the guys were not believers. I invited some guys from church to come, and they were, like, shocked. They're like, what are these people swearing for? How come you, the guys are getting in fights? Why don't they act? I said, act like what? Like Christians? They can't. They're slaves to sin. And, and sometimes we, we, again, we do an injustice, an injustice to unbelieving friends, by expecting them to live like us. And they can't. The other side of that coin is that I can. But sometimes I choose not to. And so, Christian, you have no excuse when you choose to sin. So I hope, uh, again, as personally, you all choose to be slaves of the Lord. Okay, I'm going to define a few more terms. An appetite is any of the instinctive desires necessary to keep us in organic life. That's a very poor, um, but I, I took it from a book, so I, I can't unquote a quote. Necessary desires. Eating, drinking, sleeping, working, sex. Sorry, I use that word in, in a Christian con uh, conference, but it's one of the most... Uh, normal and, and strongest appetites that we have. Worship, you see there, is also a God-given appetite, desire. We are all worshipers of one thing or another. And hopefully, God is the predominant person that we worship. Reality, day to day, that's not always the case, is it? And so as we look at our own lives, maybe there's a challenge there for us to consider. Whatever you feed your appetite will become learned or inherent desire. I know people that um, have said, uh, for the next month, I'm not going to eat sugar. And so they don't eat sugar for an entire month. And then the, the next time they have sugar, it tastes gross. Because 
something has changed. They have an inherent distaste for the things that they were training themselves to avoid. Um, you see people when they're doing any kind of training for, I don't know, walking across coals. Okay, the first time it hurts. But as you keep doing it over and over and over again, you get used to it. And in a weird way, even with things like that, and unfortunately things like cutting and self-harm, it starts to feel good. It starts to be a desire. And so we get used to these things as we continue to um, expose ourselves to them. Um, cravings are another thing that creep into our lives, and that's a physiological experience of desire for something, usually a substance, that has been used excessively. So with the sugar example, um, those first couple days when the person is trying to stop with sugar, there's a craving. There's an insatiable desire to satisfy that sugar crave. Um, excessive satisfaction of temporary appetites leads to sinful ways of acting, thinking, and speaking, along with tolerance, cravings, and dependence upon the quote-unquote drug. So, I don't know if these work, but my writing is absolutely horrible, like an incense oil cast. But we had a, a chart here. Here we go. Appetites. Appetites leads to tolerance. Let's see that in my definition. If we continue to let tolerance rule, it will lead to these cravings that are, I think, actual and physical. And then if they go unchecked, it leads to dense or <coughs> addiction or life dominating sin. Oops, that's Mormon. Sorry about that. Um, so there's this progression that you see there. Um, as things are left unchecked, it leads to a dependence or, uh, as I talked about, an addiction. And so we look at scriptures for help. And Hebrews 12.1 tells us, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside uh, every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And so there's this progression of entanglement. And it says there that it easily entangles us. I don't know if you've thought about entanglements very often, but for some reason... You know, I have these cords and cables for my computer, and I, I roll them up nicely, and I put them in my backpack, and I jump on an airplane, and I jump off the plane, and there's like 17 cables interwoven with each other, and I can't, it takes me, you know, 20 minutes to figure out where, how to plug in my phone. Entanglement seems to just naturally happen in the computer accessory world. <laughs> it also happens naturally in the spiritual world. Sin can easily entangle us if we step into that marsh. So we need to be careful with scripture, fellas. 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful for me, and I, I probably should put some qualifiers on that, uh, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so once you feel like you're like out of control, like you have to have something, that's become your master, and that's probably not a good place to be. So you want to be aware of that. Um, I made the joke in the in the last seminar. We had an announcement this morning about coffee, and I looked around the room, and there was a lot of disappointed people. Okay, I'm not one of them. I, I despise coffee, um, but it was it's interesting to me that something as innocent as coffee. Seems like you can be a master. I went to breakfast with a man several years ago uh, who, who's now an elder. If I had thought about this, I would have put in a vote against him. But um, <laughs> we, we went to breakfast and we sat down across the table from each other. And the waitress came up, nice you know, young lady, was trying to be nice and friendly, and six o'clock in the morning. And she said, How are you guys doing? I was great. How are you today? And the guy across the table from me didn't look up, he just said, Coffee. And I thought, well, that's a, kind of a little bit rude, don't you think? 
And he said, I'm serious. I can't be nice until I have my first cup of coffee. I can't interact with the world until I have my coffee. Now, I'm sure he was partly joking. But boy, that sure does seem like there was a dependence and maybe a mastery of this drug. I'm a Coke guy, so again, I have my addictions as well. But um, Coca-Cola. Don't be nasty. Because if not, it leads to idolatry. The worship of a physical object as a god or a moderate attachment or devotion to something. That's again Merriam-Webster's definition. Um, further uh, explanation. Any pleasure that becomes so excessively desired that it replaces the desire to worship God. It can become such a preoccupation in somebody's thinking that it leads to demanding temporary pleasures to gratify. I must have coffee. I must have respect. I must have cocaine. I must have a gambling win. I must have success in a video game. Fill in the blank. If you must have something, it's probably an unhealthy idol in your life. James says, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the, the source, your pleasures, that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to make himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Our selfish pleasures, that word is lust, desires, it overtakes sometimes our, our objectivity, our intellect, and just drive us to things that are not healthy. And it's not just talking about physical things. Um, if you were to look over to, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14. This really struck me the first time I, I saw these verses. Uh, it's Ezekiel chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, And some of the elders of Israel came to me, and they sat down before me. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces their stumbling block of their iniquity. Should I be consulted by them at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them, Thus says the Lord God, Any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart puts right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity, and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through all of their idols. And so God in the New Testament era or in our current day is not as concerned about us as certainly Westerners setting up wood and stone idols and bowing down before them. But he is talking about idols in our hearts. I think it was Bruce Bigney that said that our hearts are idol factories just cranking out idols. And he says here in this passage that the man sets up his idols uh, right before his face. He's, it's a stumbling block. So this is kind of a block. So let's say that um, those green, I don't know what they are, orbs that back there are God. Okay, and my focus is on God. But then I have this thing in my life that I put right before my face. And you know what? I can see a rune, and I can see Dave, I can see the globe over here, but I can't see God in my example because I have a stumbling block taking my vision away from what I'm trying to look at. And so as we set up these idols in our heart, they block our view of God. They get in the way of that relationship that he wants with us. So what are some practical things that, that we need to think about in our day and age? Um, certainly, these are all objects of idolatry. Uh, drugs and alcohol, sex, food, gambling. 
even sleep, uh, TV and the internet, exercise, sports, video games, shopping. You know, for me, um, soccer was an idol in my life. When I was in high school, I had decided that I was going to go pro, and that was all I cared about and all I focused on, all I, I did. Um, I got the I got invited to a tryout at a college after I graduated, and I was just focused on this is it. This is my, my chance to big time. And uh, I was involved in a summer training program at church uh, where we were doing classes on Tuesday and Thursday night. And so the first day of tryouts, the coach said, oh, by the way, we're going to add a third session in the evenings where we're going to go over film and strategy. And I said, uh-oh, I got a class at church. What am I going to do? So I talked to some counselors and one told me that it was okay with just a week of missing classes. It wouldn't be a big deal. I love that guy. Um, but all the rest of them said, well, Steve, this is interesting because it seems like you've got a choice to make here. And I'm not saying anything other than you might want to pray about this and see what God is trying to say. And so I prayed about it, and I remember as I was driving to tryouts, I know exactly where I was on the freeway, what car I was driving, how many miles were on the car at the time. No, not, not that quite that serious, but I, I, I broke. <coughs> and I remember crying uncontrollably and saying to the Lord, I need to give up soccer for you, don't I? And as much as it pains me to say, Lord, I will. I got to practice that day, and I told the coach, hey, coach, sorry, I can't make it uh, tonight because I've got a commitment at church. And tryouts came, and uh, I didn't make the team. And I went in, and they said, you know, come into the office and find out, you know, if you didn't make it, why? And so I went in and I said, coach, um, can you explain to me what happened? He said, well, to play at this level, you need to have 100% commitment to soccer. And you basically told me this week that you don't have that. Soccer had become an idol. And God said, I want to be number one. So we set up these idols in our lives that, you know, okay, I'm not a problem with drugs and alcohol, but exercise and sports, video games are just games. We need to be careful when things take more priority in our life than our worship of the Lord himself. If we don't be careful, these things can become an abuse the improper or excessive use or misuse of a substance. And again, you saw those on the prior screen. And it's, it's very sad that unfortunately there are Christians that abuse substances. <coughs> and you might know some, you might be one, I don't know. But there's help, there's hope. There's always hope with the Lord. So why, why would people turn to these things there's kind of a mentality of despair or hopelessness when it comes to these life dominating things so often um, and you may have heard some of these things you might have used some of these phrases yourself my life is such a waste I'm no good to anybody nobody loves me life has been unfair to me God has been unfair to me Maybe my family would be better off if I were not even here. Maybe I'd be better off if I wasn't here. You know, if I'm a Christian and I check out of this place, I get to go to heaven. That's way better than this garbage I'm going through. And let me tell you, if, if you're in this room and you're having any of these thoughts, please come and talk to me. There's so much hope in Jesus. And I know life can seem unfair. It can seem difficult. But Jesus came that we would have abundant life. And we just need to tap into that and recognize how loved we are and how accepted we are in Christ. If you have friends that are struggling with some of these things, you've got to give them hope. And as a friend, as a counselor, as a shepherd... That's one of our most powerful tools of giving people hope. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope himself fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
When people are hopeless, they need hope. And we have a God of hope. And so when people come to you that are discouraged, depressed, downcast, frustrated, trapped in sin, give them hope. If they know Jesus, they have hope. If they don't know Jesus, that's your first thing, is you can have hope in Christ. Come to him as your Savior. But we have to give people hope. Otherwise, they want to escape. Interesting proverb. It says, give strong drink to him who is perishing. And wine to those whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. One of the primary reasons people abuse substances is to escape their current reality. You know, you can become a different person on a video game. You can be the most powerful knight in the empire. You can become the fastest racer in Mario Kart world. You can have success and accolades, and especially if you're playing online games with others, you can be the hero. And all you have to do is sit there and move your thumbs. But then you come to real life, and you have to actually do something for real. It's a lot more difficult. I remember one of the girls that was in the high school class that we were working with years ago um, was into one of these games, and I don't want to say what it is because I can't remember for sure, but she told us, in life, I'm a loser. But when I go on the screen, I'm a different person. I'm in a different world. And the disappointment and the sorrow that that I caused my parents, I leave it behind because now I'm entering Wonderland. And everything is good and people try to escape and then they get caught up in this fantasy and it's hard to get out of I was dealing with another high school student who was so into these games um, that I apparently there's something there was there was something called skins and it was kind of like like costumes or outfits that you could win or buy and it, 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 it looked cooler and they gave you more power and this high school student had racked up $5,000 in debt playing video games, trying to be something on a screen that they weren't in real life. These things can have serious implications as we try to escape the reality that we're living in. I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I could escape the reality of this difficult life I'm living And oftentimes people do. I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. And again, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Um, I felt that way about 10 minutes before I was supposed to start teaching (laughs) the class. Um, People like to escape. There's emotional pain. You know, Jesus escaped from time to time. Do you know that? Turn with me to, to Mark. Yeah, turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 and verse 29. Immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came and he raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. And he healed many who were ill and various diseases and cast out demons, and he was not letting them, them to speak because they knew who he was. And just imagine this. And again, I didn't read the, the first half of the, the chapter. There's a lot of stuff going on in Jesus' life. And it's, it's overwhelming. And in verse 35, Jesus escapes started playing video games no early in the morning while it was still dark jesus got up left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there so if you need to escape run to the lord run to the father in prayer pour out your heart to him he understands he has big shoulders he can take your complaints he can take your sorrows and as you spend time with him 
you'll recognize that there's hope. You have a God who loves you, cares for you. Maybe some less obvious things that people deal with are heart problems that we don't see. Maybe it's bitterness. You know, people sometimes are jerks. Sometimes they treat us poorly. Sometimes they sin against us. And they can get bitter. Hebrews 12.15 says, Let no See to it that no root of bitterness springs up among you, and by it many be defiled. You know, bitterness is one of those things that doesn't stay alone. It spreads. And I have, in all honesty, seen at least one church torn apart because of bitterness. Someone was, was mistreated, and rather than dealing with it biblically, where they went to the praying party and, and worked through it, they told somebody else. And then they told somebody else. And then they told somebody else. bitterness it's very destructive but it happens when we get distracted when we get overwhelmed when we get hurt and we don't handle it properly the response to bitterness is forgiveness in the same way that God in Christ has forgiven you he'll also see you to forgive one another if your brother comes to you 70 times 7 times and ask for forgiveness you forgive him if you hold those things against you somebody said that the bitterness is the poison that we drink hoping somebody else will die it's destructive and it can really hurt individuals guilt is another thing that really um, Satan uses if you're a Christian and you're doing that again you have no self-control. Isn't that a fruit of the Spirit? How can you possibly be teaching that Sunday school class with that going on in your life? How can you share your faith with others when you don't even believe it yourself? Look at the way you're living. And we let that guilt get us in a spiral of despair and doubt. And it's devastating. Confession is the answer to guilt. Lord, I am a sinner. I am a failure. I have failed you again in this area. I need your help. And his grace is sufficient every time. Every single time. Discontentment. How come I don't get to teach that Sunday school class? How come I'm not in charge of the ushering ministry? How come I'm not? How come? How come? How come? Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. Can we be content with where God has us? Loneliness is another emotional problem that causes us despair. And this is really sad that Christians are oftentimes lonely. Uh, I, I was talking about the idea of a spatula in the last one, and I know some of you in this room know what that is now because you've been around me long enough. But when you're when you're baking, you know you you put your your mixer in and and the dough or whatever you're using the the batter kind of gets spread out to the sides of the bowl. And so after a while, your whatever your beaters aren't touching anything. So you got to get a spatula and you scoop around the outside of the bowl and you put it back into the middle so then that it's then it's set. Well, we need to be spiritual spatulas. So you go to church on Sunday, you go to this conference. And there'll be people that are on the outside of the bowl hanging out by themselves lonely in a room of 200 people. Do we have the concern for others to leave our conversation Dan have the conversation and then go look for somebody else to go have a cup of coffee or something something useful it happened last week was that last week at church I was there was a guy okay we go out uh, the, the, the discipleship is in Saintsville and we go to campus every week for evangelism and by God's grace people are responding 
And so we had this unsaved person come to church last Sunday, and I was talking to him, and I brought him over to the coffee pot. And so I had to get out of there because I can't get too close to coffee. I was very bad at hide. But there was another guy that actually that walked in who was another one of these lonely guys. So I said, excuse me just a second. And so I went over to talk to this guy. So the, this, this unsaved person finished their coffee, and they went and they walked over and were standing by a table by themselves. And so I'm talking to this guy who needed to be talked to, and I guess I should stand this way because I looked and I saw this unsaved guy by himself. First time ever I've heard this. And so Simon was over probably cleaning a coffee pot, <laughs> and so I walked over. kind of, I can do two things at once, I'm not a guy, uh, in that sense, <laughs> and he talked to him for 20 minutes, and Valentin came back the next week, so I guess it was two weeks ago we talked about the coffee pot, so we're kind of close, so we need to care about people, because loneliness leads to craving attention and desire and, and acceptance, and I've been doing a lot of study and, and talking over the last couple of years on the transgender movement. The fastest growing group of transgender people in the world are junior high age girls because they want to be accepted. People are lonely, and if we don't meet their needs, they're going to find them somewhere else. We need to be aware that that can lead to serious trouble, depression and despair. People pleasing fear of man all lead to misplaced identity. I need to please my, my father. I need to please my hopefully future boyfriend or girlfriend. I need to please my elders. I need to do something to impress people. I'm afraid that if I, if I do this and fail, that everybody's going to think I'm a loser at church. What if I stand up at Breaking the Bread and I say something stupid and everybody thinks I'm a moron? They already know. It doesn't really matter. We're afraid. And we say, well, if I'm not this, if I'm not that, who am I? Our identity is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. I am a new creature in Christ. I'm a new man. The old things have passed away. And so I am a Christian. And as, as uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but in this uh, LGBTQ, 2B, I, Q, quilt, whatever it is, uh, 17 acronyms now, um, movement, um, there's, a, there's a segment of the church that is now saying, well, I am a gay, celibate Christian. I don't know if you guys, anybody heard that terminology. Mm-hmm. I'm a gay, celibate Christian. And so they say, you know, I, I have these tendencies, and I'm, I'm identifying myself as gay, but I'm honoring the Bible that talks about immorality, and I'm not involved in, in any of that immorality. But I'm a gay Christian. Well, I don't identify myself as a um, murdering Christian, or a lustful Christian, or a lying Christian, or a um, brawling Christian. Why do I have to identify as a gay Christian? And so there's this identity thing that we have to be careful about in what we say it's okay to accept because I'm a Christian and I don't care what my past was I don't care what my current temptations are I don't identify myself as a TV watching gaming uh, gambling alcoholic Christian I'm a Christian and so be careful about what you think is okay to help people feel good about their identity their identity is in Christ in Christ alone and we need to stand firm on that Okay, let's get to the good news. Too long on the bad news. There's hope. Okay, there is hope in Christ. Uh, And God has provided the same thing for every Christian. He's provided us a Savior. Praise the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's provided us the indwelling Holy Spirit. You think about it. The God of the universe who spoke everything into existence from the furthest galaxy to the smallest micro something, whatever it is, I don't know how small we can see these days. God created all of that. He's awesome. He's unbelievable, and he's indwelling you if 
you know. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And that's literal. He's in you. He's dwell- I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's too big for my little brain, but I believe it. And so I can tell anybody who's struggling with any sin, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and God has given you that gift to overcome this sin. He's given us the Bible, and Peter tells us that he's given us in the Bible everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's everything. Nothing is missed. So it's not going to tell me how Cheerios for breakfast tomorrow, but it's going to tell me how to live my life and the principles that I need for every aspect of my life are contained in the Holy Scripture. The Bible is enough. If you're a theologian, it's the sufficiency of Scripture. And you've got to believe that or you're going to get messed up. See, not only has God given us kind of all the, the awesome eternal things, but he's given us each other, the church. And uh, Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling together. Not because um, he needs our attendance or he needs our money, but we need each other. And some people say, and I think Rick mentioned it, um, well, I like Jesus, but I'm not too fond of the church. Well, the church is for you, and you're for the church. (coughs) And we need each other. And so if you're not there, Simon's got to do your job. And he's going to get tired. But more importantly, in the context of what we're talking about today, you have other people that love you and care for you and can help you if you're honest and open. If we have prayer, we can directly talk to the God of the universe. That's a gift that he's given us to help in times of trouble. And again, fellowship with other believers in the church. So what does this look like? Transformation process. It starts with repentance. Okay, You need to recognize that something's wrong. If there's a dominating sin in your life, you're going the wrong way. You're following the wrong master. You're walking on the wrong path. You need to repent. And repent means to turn from and to turn to. And so you're turning back to the Lord. But with repentance comes three things. Responsibility, gratitude, and submission. And we'll explore those a little bit deeper here. The responsibility is to recognize a potential temptation. Satan is our enemy, and he wants to attack us. And so if this classroom is my fort, I have some vulnerabilities right now. I have two open doors. If I know the enemy's coming, I probably should close those doors. I might want to throw some chairs in front of them to block off the entrance. But more significantly, honestly, we have an entire bank of open windows, glass windows anyway very easy to break so if I know the enemy is going to come from here I'm going to get a couple of desks and prop them up here and and maybe have a room come and hold them because he's a strong guy and and I'm going to fortify the vulnerable areas of my fortress well your life is a fortress and Satan wants to get in and damage your heart and captivate it and addict it to sinful things so where is he going to come in Is it going to be with relationships? Is it going to be with prestige? Is it going to be with a substance, a thrill, a momentary pleasure? Whatever your area of weakness is, recognize it and do something to defend against it. Take precautions. Um, Avoid people and places that might lead into temptation. 1 Corinthians tells us, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Well, I'm going to share with them. How many times do you need to get drunk to share with them? Be careful about who you hang around with. You become like the people you're with. Uh, If you do, when you do recognize the sin, you need to confess it and ask for forgiveness. And God is faithful every time to forgive us. There's that hope. Gratitude. Okay, this is a, an attitude that can really help in our emotional struggles. Uh, having the eternal focus. Okay, playing the long game. And I guess that's kind of a golf term. Um, I don't have a, a long game, but I, I understand people do, and they hit the ball really far. Um, eventually I'll get there, you know, 17, 18 shots later. 
but I, in that sense, I guess I am playing the long game. I don't care how many shots it takes me to get there. I'm getting my money's worth. But I eventually will get to the hole, the, the win. Okay, well, in this life, it's hard. And sometimes I'm in the rough. Sometimes I'm in the lake. Sometimes I lose the ball. But at the end of the day, I know we win because I'm on Jesus' side. More likely, he's on my side. And so we have to recognize, yeah, we fail, we sin, we trip, we fall. But we know we get back up, we repent, we have forgiveness, and we press on and we have that eternal focus. In the end, we win. Uh, it was referred to in one of the messages, I can't remember which one, but the, that old uh, song, Jesus and Others and You, having a, the focus on others before ourselves. Um, so often, uh, I used to go to a Bible study where we had a lot of I guess I'll call them um, socially challenging people. Because, again, where are people going to get accepted and loved? In the church. And so we had a lot of these people that were just, uh, like, I wouldn't bring my brothers to the Bible study because they'd be just making fun of them the whole night. That's the kind of groups we had. And so, so there were times, and in all honesty, I'd go, I don't want to go tonight because Charles is going to be there and Garrett's going to be there and Sammy's going to be there. And, oh, my goodness, these guys are and so I'd go anyway, and the Lord would kind of slap me around on the way there. And invariably, I'd say at least 10 or 12 times that I can remember very clearly, driving home, I'm just like pumped. I'm totally excited about, that was an awesome Bible study. And the Lord would kind of tap me on the shoulder and go, um, remember that attitude? When I got over my pity party and focused on others, God had this supernatural way of filling and blessing me beyond what I could ever imagine with that study. And so as we focus on others rather than our problems, God somehow supernaturally meets our needs. And so if you're helping somebody that's struggling in this area, give them somebody to minister to. Give them a responsibility, and you'll see an attitude change. Uh, singing, uh, again, you don't have to be any good, um, but somehow there's something about music and singing that can change our attitude. Um, we saw, we see it with, with um, David and Saul. Um, just there's a soothing, calming influence and, and sometimes just a, an ability to, to get caught up, if you will, in, in the focus of the Lord. Giving thanks. Um, Lord, you're sovereign and I don't understand this, I don't like this, but you love me, you're perfectly good and perfectly righteous and perfectly loving. And so I thank you for this because I guess it means you're making me like Jesus. And so I appreciate that. Thanks. Memorizing verses about thankfulness. I have a list of about 40 here. If you want them afterwards, I'll give them to you. Um, but letting the word um, dominate your mind and your heart. With transformation comes submission. First of all, and clearly and obviously, submission to God. God has to be number one, and I bow the knee to him. Um, we all will at some point. We read about that in Philippians. Might as well start now. Um, we need to be in submission to our church leadership. We saw earlier in, in um, Hebrews 13, 17, obeying those who are leaders and submitting to them as those who are given account. And, it, you know, the weird thing about this or the challenging thing about this is that uh, elders and church leaders are sinners as well, and sometimes they don't get it right. Um, but they'll give an account to the Lord for their lives so we need to submit to them and let the Lord take care of them. And then having accountability, and I say partners slash partners. Um, this is particularly uh, challenging in the area of pornography um, where, uh, I don't know, I've, I've talked to probably, I try not to exaggerate, probably 30 or more guys that have struggled, and girls that have struggled in this area. And to a person, they say, you need more than one accountability partner to have victory in this area. And I don't know why, it's, it's by God's grace, it's not an area that I've struggled with, so I can't personally speak to it. But I say, like I said, 25 to 30 people have told me, you've got to be vulnerable, you've got to be submissive, you've got to be willing to admit your, your need, um, and oftentimes more, more than one person. So again, if that's an area that you're struggling, I have some resources, um, and I'm happy to, to pray with you and for you in that area. The transformation process, this is kind of a simple three-step biblical pattern, uh, putting off the old pattern, renewing the mind, and putting on godly habits. So if you want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, 
either taking my advice or singing. <laughs> Ephesians 4, we see this principle very clearly in verse 22 uh, through 24. Okay, um, I guess verse 20 just says that the context, you didn't, you didn't learn Christ in this way. It says, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside or put off the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of its deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside, etc., etc., and then putting on. Uh, the same principle is seen over in Colossians chapter 3, um, starting in verse 9. Actually, verse 8. But now you also put them all aside, or put them off. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self, who is being renewed uh, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So this precept process of putting off the old, allowing God to renew your mind, and then putting on uh, good habits. Um, that's the thing with uh, addiction or cravings and all this. Um, and the first slide I talked about was habits. Habits can be good. If we continue to do the same thing over and over and over again, it becomes a habit, and those are good things. Um, exercise would be one of those. Um, okay, put off. I mentioned earlier, um, where am I? Bad company corrupts good morals. Oops, there we go. Um, you might need to get rid of some friends. Okay, if they are pulling you down, drop them like a hot rock. I know that's hard to say. I mean, it's easy to say up here. It's hard to do in real life. Because, again, we talked about loneliness, and sometimes you're so desperate for a friend, you're willing to compromise. That's not going to be good in the long run. Um, you're going to be corrupted. Um, don't associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man, or you'll learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. Um, you probably all have been around people where um, they'll start saying or doing something, and you kind of go along because they're influential, they're charismatic, they're fun. Uh, you have that fear of man that we talked about earlier. You don't want to disappoint them. And so you start um, laughing at those off-color jokes. And maybe you add a couple of your own. You start agreeing with the gossip and adding some more fuel to that fire. You start agreeing with their anger and, and pile on that unfair situations they're saying to you and their anger and disappointment <coughs> and bitterness. Um, put those things away. Don't associate with heavy drinkers of wine or gluttonous eaters of meat. The same principle is there. You hang out with those people, you're going to be like them. But in order to put off, you got to be willing. So you want to ask yourself a couple questions. Are you willing to do anything and everything <coughs> to overcome this problem? How bad do you want holiness? We had an elder, and I apologize for this, but this is what he said, so I'm quoting, not making it up. He said, you need to be willing to push dog do across a chapel parking lot with your nose if that's what God requires for you to get this thing right. And again, it's a gross, vivid picture, but the point is, how desperate are you to deal with your sin? Hebrews says, you haven't come to the point of shedding blood and you're struggling against sin. Are you willing to shed blood? I remember one time my dad was cutting trees. He loves cutting trees. And I was at the bottom holding the rope. And so when he cut it, he was going to you know, kind of lower it down, and I was going to, you know, with the rope, kind of lower it down. And he cut a piece that he thought was fine, but it wasn't. And so I started to get lifted off the ground. And I was like, well, if I let this thing fall, it's going to damage something on my dad's property, so I better hold on. And so I started, like, flying. And then I realized after that, oh, probably like, you know, eight inches off the ground, this is not a good idea. <laughs> so I, start, I loosened my grip. I don't know if you've ever held a rope that started sliding. Yeah. And I was like, shh, shh, and just drew blood. I mean, it's kind of like white, but then it's like seeping blood. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. It's, it, yeah, it hurt. But let me tell you, bad idea. I was not that smart. But I was striving against the load coming down because I didn't want whatever my dad's stuff to get broke. Are we striving against sin? 
I'm gonna, this hurts, it's burning, but I'm going to not let something get broken. I'm not going to let sin dominate my life. Do you want to overcome the issue or just live with it? Renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's some supernatural thing going on here, whereas I let the word come into my eyes, into my mind, I'm transformed. There's a computer phrase, garbage in, garbage out. In the same sense, beauty in, beauty out. If you um, inundate your, your life with the word of God, there will be positive results. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, <coughs> singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This has the idea of studying, meditating, memorizing the scripture, letting it richly dwell within you. Not just a quick five-minute read or a speed reading Evelyn Wood class, but dwelling on the word, letting it dwell in you. Meditating, studying, ruminating, some would say and in our mind as those thoughts come and those thoughts usually lead to actions we need to stop it we need to take every thought captive okay we have a police officer in the room and he has probably captured some people in his day okay I've seen a couple of cop movies and they like handcuff people and throw them in the back of the car and then they throw them in the, in the clinker that's what we need to do with our bad thoughts we need to handcuff them and throw them in the dungeon and take them captive because as we think on those things and dwell on them, they often come out in the things we say or worse than the things that we do. We need to have our minds renewed. And finally, we need to put on good habits by the power of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Um, another good one is 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for only old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You know, discipline is hard. It's training. It's practicing. And so I want to discipline myself for the purpose of godliness. Okay? In, in high school and college, I disciplined myself for the purpose of soccer. Long story, I got back into soccer later, but that's another story. Um, but I had a goal and a purpose to improve and to be good at something. Okay? Do I have a goal to be good at godliness it takes practice it takes discipline and we need to put those things on put on those good habits um, you know if you need to put on your phone appointment with God you know oftentimes I meet with Garrett early in the morning for breakfast and not once has he ever stood me up and and vice versa because I have on my calendar Garrett six o'clock now six thirty um, Wednesday morning well, I wouldn't think of offending a friend by not showing up. So I put on my calendar, appointment with God. I think I'm going to miss that. So as I do that time and time and time again, it becomes a godly habit. So practice those things, formulate them. Your word of I treasure in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'll stop there. Treasure the word in your heart. Okay, you can get the rest of that verse. We're getting hungry. Um, so a couple practical things. Put this on your mirror, on your dashboard, on your stick shift. Lord, I'm planning to, whatever you're planning on doing, right now for your glory. I'm going to do this unto you, Father God, because I know it will please you. And if you can't write that thing that you're going to do, you better not be doing it. Okay, having a practical reminder. And i got to speed through these last things, sorry, because I, I don't want Derek to miss dinner. Prepare a Philippians 4 think list. Okay, I'm going to think on these things. I'm going to purposely let good things into my mind. I'm going to have a list. I'm going to change the thought about someone from a negative to a positive. Okay, no matter how terrible your friend is, there's something good about them. So when people start saying, oh yeah, that guy's so lazy, he's so stupid. Yeah, but he's got cool shoes. I mean, whatever. Find something good about the person that you can say. And over time, it'll become a habit and it'll become natural. Um, when ungodly talk starts up, change the subject, whether it be subtly or unsubtly. Stay away from the appearance of evil. Um, have an answer ready for those who might pressure you to go to the crowd. You know, I'm, I'm 
that's an area that if I start doing that, I really end up being doing something stupid. So I'd rather avoid that right now. Have things in mind that you're going to say. Uh, mute the TV when commercials come on that promote discontentment, pleasure with no consequences or other evil. That's basically every commercial. So maybe don't watch TV at all. Um, avoid channel surfing, especially late at night when you're alone. Uh, put limits on your computer and phone and ask somebody else to, ha to have the password so you can't cheat. Um, okay, some practical things. Get enough sleep. Usually when you're tired, you're uh, less self-controlled. Um, exercise regularly. Eat well. Um, show some self-control. You know, self-control... Uh, I thought that was interesting. This, uh, I was reading something this week. Self is not the source. Self is the object. And so self needs to be controlled, not by me, but by the Holy Spirit. And then finally be busy with the Lord's work. And so, again, sorry about the rush there. Uh, Steve may be late. Um, if you want the slides, there's the, the sign-up sheet. Uh, if there's areas you want to talk about, um, I'm here for dinner. I might treat. Uh, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for the fact that we can overcome. Lord, greater is he who in is, is in us than he who is in the world. I pray that we believe that and we live it and we share it with those we're trying to help. Uh, thank you, Lord, for loving us and caring for us and giving us hope. In Jesus' name. Somewhere.